Hello, it's Martina, AKA King Kogi. And today things are gonna get a little bit saucy. I'm not sure if I'm talking about sauces or if I'm talking about something that involves like condiments, which would be condimentary, my dear Watson. I thought about that joke at 3 a.m. when I couldn't sleep one night. So today I wanna to go over about eight Japanese pantry essentials. I didn't say panty essentials, which panties can be essential, but that's a different video. There are more than eight, obviously, but I hope these ones can get you started on some of the foods you love. If you're interested in Japanese cooking, it can be extremely overwhelming to try to figure out what to buy at a grocery store. And on my King Kogi YouTube channel, I'm going to be making a complimentary video to this. It's actually a cooking video, so I'm doing some of my favorite Japanese breakfast foods using the items that I'm talking about today. All right, my nerdy learning cooking friends, let's get started. So if you're looking to make miso soup, udon, tempura dipping sauce, steamed egg custard, da chahawan moshi, chahawan mushi, I can never say it, chahawan mushi, or sukiyaki hot pot, you're gonna have to have dashi. Dashi mahat, dashi mahat. So the average Japanese home would probably be using these pre-made dashi packets. Let me show you what this average dashi tea bag looks like. So dashi is the soup stock of the cooking world. It's kind of like how you use beef stock or you use vegetable stock. So dashi is what's used for everything Japanese and you can get these pre-made packs. They basically smell horrific. This is like a fish tea bag and I can smell it throughout the whole house right now. Like seriously, P-U, ew, you stink. But really, really necessary. This is kind of like a cheaper one. It's made with katsuo. And if you cut the tea bag open, you can see what's inside of it. It's got all these little dried bits. It's like shaved down uh, dried bonito. They might have shrimp inside of it. It could have mushrooms. It's basically just a tea bag of fish. Yummy. Gosh, it smells so bad, you guys. You don't even know right now. Like I keep mine inside of a convenient Ikea container because it's smell proof. It is seriously that stinky. If you have a cat, the cat's gonna be like meow, 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 the whole time you are cooking with these. Dashi. And it's a lot more subtle than it looks and smells because the dashi doesn't have anything like salt in it. So when you think about using soup stock, instant soup stock items in North America, we often use like chicken stock or, or beef bouillon and it has a lot of flavors in there, including salt. This doesn't have any additional flavors like that. It really is dried ingredients like making a fish tea. The flavor is quite subtle and so you will add to it. For example, you'll use it for making miso soup, but you have to add things like miso to it. But if you try to make miso soup with just water, it's gonna taste strangely flat and beany. Now, if you don't eat items with fish in them, be aware that majority of dashi packs do have a type of dried fish in it. In which case you can use dried shiitake mushrooms. And so you can make yours using shiitake mushrooms and kombu if you want. Or it goes upside down. Or you can do just shiitake mushrooms, but you do have to rehydrate them first, squeeze them on out, and then you can start cooking with them. Or you can cook with all of these things and create like a super rich stock. So you can also make your dashi from scratch. You're gonna need kombu, which is seaweed, and it's been dried. It has all this kind of like white stuff on it, and that is natural MSG. And people will say that you can like wipe it down with a soft cloth in order to get rid of anything like maybe some stones or grits, but you don't wanna like wash this off. This is what you need to soak to create the actual soup base. Oh, and make sure you don't throw out the mushrooms once they're rehydrated. You can chop those up and use them inside of soups and stir fries and other items. Now you might have seen some Japanese food with these kind of pink and light brown flakes on them and they look like they're kind of like folding and dancing and it looks like it's something that's alive. Well, it's not alive. It's actually a very, very thinly sliced piece of fish and the heat is causing it to like wiggle and move. You've probably seen it before on okonomiyaki. That's that savory pancake or maybe something from Osaka. Like they have like the octopus balls and sometimes they add them on top of that. So this is actually fish, it's bonito. And they cut them into these like slabs and they're dried, smoked and fermented and they are absolutely rock hard. These dried fermented slabs are put against these special blocks with blades on them and they shave them into these thin curls. Thin curls that look kind of like this, but this particular type of katsuoboshi is used for seasoning on top of things like tofu or on okonomiyaki. It tastes a little bit lighter and it's shaved quite thinly. 
You can also buy a different type of katsuobushi that's used for flavoring your soup. So if you're making dashi from scratch, which I've made a video before on how to make dashi, you put those on top of the hot water and it kind of soaks in and creates that smoky, slightly fishy taste. You can also feed it to your kitty cats. It is a really nice way to take something that's simple like tofu and add a little bit of the katsuobushi on top of it, maybe a little bit of shredded ginger, a little bit of sesame oil or soy sauce, shoyu, and you immediately get that Japanese flavor bang. And it's diverse because you can use it for making soup, but you can also use it for raw items. onto shoyu, AKA soy sauce, AKA soya sauce. Now the one thing Japanese people do not do with soy sauce is pour it on their rice. It seems to be something that goes on when you go to a restaurant outside of Japan, they'll have like soy on the table, soy sauce, and people will get their white rice and will just pour the sauce on it. The equivalent would be you taking a salt shaker and opening it up and just like pouring it out on your pasta or like pouring it out on your rice. Like that's just not what it's used for but it is used for adding flavoring to different side dishes or for working with the dashi. So if you want to have udon or dipping sauces, hot pots, right? When you're doing the shabu shabu meat, they all have like a teaspoon or a tablespoon of soy sauce in them. So it's used more as part of a sauce ingredient rather than the sauce itself. Even the soy sauce you use for dipping your sashimi or your sushi in can be a different type. Now be aware that not all soy sauce is made the same. Think of it like salad dressing. You can get yourself an Italian salad dressing and you might have one that you like more than another one because maybe it's sweeter or maybe it has a more vinegary taste to it or maybe it has some kind of herb in it that you really like. Soy sauce is also made in many different ways resulting in different types of subtleties and saltiness. Some are better for eggs, some are better for making a soup with. So make sure you try more than one brand if you can. And if you come to Japan, this is your chance, you guys, to put this in your luggage. There are cheaper soy sauces, like this one is a lot cheaper, but it doesn't have like the depth that something like this kind of a soy sauce would have. This soy sauce is made in the traditional way. And how the heck is soy sauce made? So first you've got the soybeans, they are steamed, and then they take wheat and the wheat is roasted and then it's crushed. Then you've got koji. Koji is the bacteria that they use to ferment it. So if you make any kind of bread or if you make any kind of yogurt, you usually have a bacteria starter. So they take the steamed soybeans, they take the roasted wheat that's been crushed and that has that flavor to it. They add it to the koji and then they put that all in like salty water magic and then it ferments. Then it's pressed and it's bottled. Every single factory has a different way of making it. They might have different soybeans they use, different wheat they use. Some soy sauces ferment for years. You can imagine the flavors. It's kind of like getting an old cheese. You can get old Parmesan or old aged cheddar and they all taste different. But no matter what kind you get, you must have soy sauce in your house for a pantry staple when working with Japanese food. Now onto mirin and cooking sake. This is something that really surprised me. I had no idea that this was used in Japanese cooking. It is a sweet rice wine. And what does that mean? Well, it's a pretty low alcohol content wine. It's made with like a sticky or glutinous rice plus koji, and it creates a kind of simple sweet white alcohol. This alcohol can be really low, like down in the 1% or it can be higher up in like the 11 to 14% depending on the kind you buy. But when you cook with it, it burns off. So why are they using this kind of like sweet cooking wine? Well, it's really great at evening out kind of a gamey or fishy flavor. It's used a lot in things like glazes or making something like a teriyaki sauce, which we don't really make in Japan. Like nobody says teriyaki sauce for anything. They might just say like tare, like T-A-R-E, which means like sauce in general. I think that's where teriyaki might've come from. I am not a teriyaki historian, this is just my guess, but for example, if you go for yakitori, that grilled chicken on a stick, they'll ask you if you want shio or tare. Shio means salted and tare is a sauce and everyone's sauce is different. They like dip it in and give it to you. It's always a little bit sweet. It's not like a salty, salty sauce. So I think that's where the teriyaki concept came from. In which case, you're gonna need mirin for making that. And then cooking sake is just normal sake, but like the cheapest sake you can buy. And I just got this at the Convenia. I grabbed a, a cheaper one. You can often evaporate the alcohol in the microwave beforehand. So it does add a bit of a, a flavor that's very distinctively Japanese. Woo! 
Let's talk about miso. Now, a lot of people think of miso, they just think of miso soup, but it actually goes way beyond that. You can use it to make condiments. You can use it for dressings, like salad dressings, or for putting it on top of vegetables. The breakfast dish that I make on the King Kogi channel is gonna be focusing with miso. You can also use it in a marinade, or you can use it baking things. I've had some incredible miso-crusted fish. It's sweet, it's savory, it has like texture to it. And the good news is you don't have to use that much of it. So if you do decide to buy a pack of miso, it can last you quite some time. I always keep two different kinds of miso in my house. Uh, let's take a look at the one that I use the most. Now there are so many different kinds of miso paste that you can buy. It can be extremely overwhelming. I personally prefer a blend of different types of miso, something I didn't even know existed before. This is the darker one. It has a saltier taste usually. And this one is kind of the more common, which is salty, but also a little bit sweet. If you see a white miso paste, it's usually quite sweet. If you live in Kyoto, they tend to use a lot of the sweeter misos. I like to blend my misos together so that I have a little bit of extra salty and a little bit of medium range salt to create like a different kind of flavor blend. So what the heck is miso? So miso is cooked soybeans that's been mixed with koji, you guessed it. Then it's mixed with salt water and then this is fermented for maybe like several months or so. Of course, there's miso that's been fermented even longer. All these ingredients that are fermented are really great for your tummy because it's giving you that healthy fermented bacteria. When I was in Korea, we used duenjang and that's the chunky looking brown kind of miso version. And it also tastes different. Each culture has their own type of soybean they're using, their own type of koji or fermented starter that they're using. And I'm curious if there's other cultures that I haven't visited that also use a type of fermented bean paste. I would love to know in the comment section below where you're from or where your culture's from and what kind of fermented bean paste name you have. So there are so many more Japanese essential pantry items I could talk about, but I think that these ingredients can get you started. Even if you just get like the dashi pack and some miso, you're already on your way to making miso soup. Pantry essentials over. Um, next time, panty essentials. Thank you.